that being said, you know, I want to, I have the privilege of introducing our 10 minutes of fire. Uh, this young man, I could say that I've seen him, I've seen him growing. I've seen him be a seeker. He's seeking after God. I see him having a hunger for the word. He has a hunger for ministry. He could be doing all kinds of other stuff. You know, and every time I have to bring him to church, he always wants to write a church at the, at the time I need to get ready or rest or I don't know what. I'm like, man, I got to bring you to church. But every time I got to remind myself, man, this kid wants to be here early in a part of what God is doing right here in the house. I, it's been a prayer of my heart. Lord, let my children rise up and help us build the church right here. He's on fire. He's representing the third wave. Give a good hand for Luke Leturco as he makes his way up tonight. Come on. You know, I'm, I'm so grateful for this opportunity, you know, I'm, I'm so grateful for my parents, um, for God, for no one, for anyone that doesn't know me, for anyone that doesn't know me, my name's Luke, um, I was just on the keys tonight, and um, I've been playing keys for a little while now, and I'm grateful for, like, man. I had it all planned in my head, you know, but God moves in different ways. Man, um, well, I'm, I'm 17 years old. I'm a junior in high school. I'm, I'm in 11th grade. And I'm just so thankful for you, Dad, and for Mom. Everything you've done in my life, you know, the guidance you gave me. I'm so grateful. And um, I'm grateful for God. I want to thank God for my salvation, you know, for saving my life. Um, but I just want to open up with the scripture, so if everyone could turn their Bibles to the book of Proverbs, chapter 24, verse 16. And for the sake of time, I'll just read it. It says, for, the righteous, for though the righteous fall seven times, they rise again. But the... Hello? Hello? All right, we're back on. <laughs> for though the righteous fall seven times, they rise again. But the wicked stumble when calamity strikes. God, I just want to thank you here today. I just use me as a vessel to speak your word, God. Just, I'm very grateful for the time you've given me, Lord, and just thank you for everything you've done in my life. In Jesus' name, Amen. amen. You may be, everyone may be seated. Uh, you don't got to stand for a while. <laughs> okay, so the title of my message today is temptations. Can someone say temptations? Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna have two points: how to overcome temptation, and what happens when you fall into temptation when you sin. So my first point, overcoming temptation, we're going to be looking at the book of Genesis. Um, it's a story about Joseph. So Joseph was a, a well-built young man, and he was a servant for this guy named uh, Potiphar. I'm pretty sure that's how you say it. But he was a servant for him. But in the Bible, it says, uh, one day Potiphar's wife soon began to look at him lustfully. Come and sleep with me, she demanded. But over and over again, Joseph told her every time, no, no. And she kept bugging. She was like, come on, come on, just once. But every time he's like, no, I'm not, I'm not going to sleep with you. Just stop. Okay. Then the Bible reads like this. One day, however, no one else was around. I was like, oh, shoot, what's going to happen? But when he went in to do his work, right, no one was around. And she came and grabbed him by his cloak. She, she grabbed him, like, grabbed his shirt. Come and sleep with me. She demanded again. But Joseph, Joseph tore himself away. He tore his shirt off and was like, heck no, I'm out of here. He got out of there. He booked it, you know. He was out. <laughs> So the point I'm trying to get to is Joseph handled this situation perfectly, right? So if we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, it says the temptations in your life are no different from others' experience, like we might experience with Joseph's experience. And God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you could stand. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. Can we praise him for that? You know, God's good, you know? Like through all that temptation, God provides us a way out. Just like right there where he did it, Joseph, and like it, it was more like broad for Joseph, like literally a way out. He just walked out the door, you know, but God provided him that way out. And God, and God didn't give him a temptation he couldn't handle. He was able to bear that temptation and endure through God, and he was able to use God's way out. But sometimes, even me, I fall short of this. We try to beat temptation by ourselves, right? So what I mean by that is we try to battle against it. We try to fight against this temptation by ourselves by like, putting myself in a, in a bad situation where I know I'll be tempted and I know I'll probably be put into sin 
but I want to see, okay, let me, let me see how, like, how long I can endure this. Let me see how long I could go without sinning. But no, that's not the way. God called us to use his way, right? And only with God are we able to endure this temptation. And God, again, like in 1 Corinthians, God provides us this way out. And with this way out, he tells us to flee. And the Bible says, flee from your youthful passions and pursue righteousness. I'm reading it one more time. Flee from youthful passions and pursue righteousness. In other words, flee from that temptation. Flee from that youthful temptation. So if you combine the two, God's giving us this way out. God, with, through God, he's giving us this way out, and he's telling us to flee from this temptation, right? I know a lot of people, they get it mixed up, and, and they try to take it on, but no, uh, it's only God's way. No, it's not our way, but by God's way. And, but when I was writing this down, you know, I was asking myself, like, like, um, how can we flee? Like, in a physical sense, it seems, like, um, pretty um, obvious, right? Like, we just get out of situations, like, we're not supposed to be in. Like, man, I know I'm not going to go to that party, I'm, so I'm not going to go, you know? It, it's, it's a pretty simple sense like that, right? But some people don't get it, but <laughs> it's pretty simple. <laughs> but in a spiritual sense, it's, it's hard. It's, it's hard, like, man, how do I flee from this temptation that's in my mind? Like, how do I get away from it? It's in my head. I, I can't run from it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if we go back to sec, um, the verse in 2 Timothy, it says, flee from youthful passions and pursue righteousness. So for anyone that doesn't get it, when we pursue this righteousness, we're having our eyes on God. And we don't, we don't have the time to even look at the temptations. We just, we just leave it behind, right? So, but when we're so focused on this temptation... Um, and we're like, I'm not going to sin, I'm, I'm not going to sin, I'm not going to sin. You're bound to sin. Like, that's all you can think about. It's, it's bound to happen, right? But when you're focused on God, when you have your eyes on God in his word, he's going to get you through it. You know, when he, when he provides that way out and you flee, he's going to get you through that temptation. You're going to be able to endure it. But it's hard for some people, you know. Like, for me, it's hard for me. It's hard to stay righteous, you know. It's a, it's a long, narrow path. And, and we want to straight cook it sometimes. We want to feed our flesh. and Like, um, but you know it's nothing to laugh about. Like, it, everyone goes through it, you know? Like, and, and we shouldn't ever put someone down for, for falling into it, you know? Pick them back up, right? So it could be hard. So that leads me into my second point, which is falling into temptation. So when you fall into this temptation, you're falling into sin. You give yourself to the sin, right? And that, that hurts God, you know? That's, um, you, know, you fall into sin, but... But it happens to everyone, right? So the important thing is to not dwell on it. There's no reason to dwell on this and beat yourself up for it. There's, there's three things you got to do, all right? I'm going to give you three things. Someone say three things. Are right, you ready? I was like, um, my boy Nate was, oh, no, it was Max. Max and Nate were helping, out, helping me out with this. I was like, oh, this is pretty good. All right, these three things. Ready? Recognize, repent, and reach out. Ready? Just those three things. I'll go more into it. But recognize, repent, and reach out. Can someone say recognize? recognize. Okay, so we need to recognize. Once we've sinned, just recognize what you did. Recognize, like, the weight of that sin and, and what you did was wrong. It sounds like, like you're speaking to a little kid almost, you know, but, like, it, it starts there. Like, recognize what you did. Like, man, you just sinned, you just sinned against God, you know? Like, he, he made you in his image, and, and you sinned against him. It, it's heavy. It's it's a terrible thing, but it's important, again, not to dwell on it. Because, but when you recognize this, recognition leads to confession, right? Which takes us to repent. Someone say repent. In uh, 1 John, it reads, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. All right, now watch this, though. After that, it says, but if we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. So if we're not recognizing that sin, if we're not recognizing what we did is wrong, we're like, oh, it's fine. I, it's, it's not that bad. All I did is lie, you know? No, but God said, like, in, I, in God's eyes, like, sin is sin. It doesn't matter. So if you don't recognize that sin, how, how is God supposed to forgive what you can't for, uh, confess? My bad. Let me say that again. How is God supposed to forgive what you can't confess? So, so it's important to recognize and confess, repent, and God, and God will forgive you, like, like no, um, even though it's sinning, and you know, like, like it's uh, it's a heavy statement. You you go to you go to hell for this. Like, you, the tomorrow's not promised, but God wants to forgive you. God wants you to repent because He loves you. He's um, 
man, he'll forgive you. He just loves you. Yeah, give us a praise. Because God loves all of us. You know, he wants to forgive us. And then the Bible says, once we repent, we'll feel refreshed. We're, we feel like refreshed and Jesus will come to us. Just like how many have like came to the altar and were just like bawling their eyes. I'm like, I'm sorry, God, I'm sorry. Yeah, and you walk back to your seat, it's like pretty awkward. Like, oh, shoot, that was all. Everyone's just looking at me crying. But when you get back to your seat or when I get home, I feel refreshed. I'm like, man, I just gave my life to God over and over again. I'm, I'm free of sin. I'm washing this blood, right? Man, I feel good. I'm so, I'm so thankful for God. Like, he, like, he's so forgiving. Like, no matter how many times I mess up. Okay, last one. You ready? Someone say, reach out. In Proverbs 11, verse 14, it says, Without guidance, a people will fall. But with many counselors, there is deliverance. So I don't know about you guys, but I have so many great leaders. You know, I have my dad. I have Max, um, Aaron. I'm so grateful for them, you know, because I could reach out to them. And I, I seek that guidance. And with that guidance, there, there's deliverance, you know. With the wisdom, I don't know how the scripture no, goes, but, like, um, it's something uh, a man with no knowledge, it, like a... I don't know how it goes. But something like you don't have knowledge, like it's going to kill you, right? Like it's so it's important to seek that wisdom and seek that guidance. Okay. And then I just want to close with the same scripture I opened with in Proverbs. For though the righteous fall seven times, they rise again. Just that part. Just focus on that part. For though the righteous fall seven times, they rise again. So just like I said, everyone's going to sin. Everyone's going to fall. You know, God loves us and forgives us. And it's a matter of, are we going to get up or are we going to stay on the ground? Are we going to get up and pick up our cross again or are we, we going to stay there just feeling sorry for ourselves? No, get up and follow God. You know, God loves you. God forgives you. And I'm so thankful for this opportunity you guys gave me. I'm thankful for my dad. And um, I just want to pray out so if we could pray. Father, thank you for um, delivering this message. Thank you for using me. Um, I hope everyone here got something from your word. We're so thankful for everything you've done and for rescuing us from these temptations, God. Even though we fall, you forgive us, and we're so thankful for you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You know, tonight we're, we're, we're super blessed to have um, this precious couple with us. Um, they come, they're coming all the way from Mesa, Arizona, by, by way of San Francisco. Come on, somebody. And um, they're, they're born and raised in the Bay. And, it, and it's just amazing to see, like, what God has done in their lives and the journey that God has t- taken them on. And, um, and we're, we're going to be praying. We're going to be praying for, um, for a, one, a, my other son, Nehemiah, tonight. Come on up here, Nehemiah. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask if Pastor Danny would come, too. And also, you know, Pastor Moses could come. And, and, um, and if Anthony could come. And Raymond, why don't you come up here, too, Raymond? And we're going to pray for him. Because tomorrow, me and him are jumping on the airplane, and we're going to Amsterdam. Come on, somebody. We're going to Amsterdam, Holland. And, uh, and my son, is he's going to the UTC. I think that probably more out of God's will than his, you know. And, you know, he's like, man, Dad, like, you know. But he's been trusting us, and he's been letting us lead him. And I know God has called him. I know God has great things for him. He's a leader. You're a leader, Mio. You're a, you're a born leader. God's called you to lead, your, you know, your generation. In one way, one shape, one form, somehow God's going God's to gonna do what he's called you to do. You were, born, you were born for this. You were born for this. Amen. And, uh, and you know, me and Mama love you. We've been battling with you, for you. And so to be here, tonight's a special night. They just realizing it's like a historic night to see Luke preach. That was his first time preaching here in the church. And now, you know, to pray for Nehemiah. And then it's so fitting because I don't think it's any secret. You know, Nehemiah hasn't been, he's not one to be, to fake the funk. You know, he's always tried to keep it real. Even when it was real, real, you know what I mean? It was like real, real. And, um, and he was making a bunch of bad decisions, you know, and, and so kind of like an act of desperation. One time I was talking to Danny on the phone. He's like, how you doing, man? I'm like, ah, that's going terrible, my son. And I don't know, the devil's a liar. And he was like, oh, man, okay, uh, well, <laughs> he was right, like, I didn't expect that. And then I think it's because God, you know, wanted to use him to help us. And the door opened for Nehemiah to go to Mesa 
for like almost six months, I think you were there, right? And, um, and we said, I said, I just need to get him out of here, man. I need to get him out of here. And, um, and with, through a little bit of help, a little help from the L.A. County court system, you know, he ended up in Mesa, Arizona. <laughs> and, uh, and he was under this man right here. He was his first home director, right? And God, God used uh, him and the home and Nehemiah's life. And God used Nehemiah in his life. Come on, somebody. I'm making a leader out of him. And, uh, and then, you know, he came to Whittier, and he finished off his time in Whittier at the home. And so we're just so happy, man, and so excited. And so Pastor Danny's here, and I'm going to ask him to pray for you. But right before we pray, tell us, tell us what you're feeling. Uh, I just want to say... Thank you to everybody here. Big thank you to my dad, to Raymond, Raymond Aon, yeah. Pastor Danny, and uh, everybody that be that be looking out for me. You know, speaking life, and yeah. I, I need it. You know. But, uh, yeah, so I was, you know, messing up, and I, I was able to go to the home, and and, and uh, a big thank you to my home director for sticking it out with me. Because that first six months, I don't, man, I don't even, I don't know how I got through that. <laughs> but the last six months, well, the first six months too, in the last six months, I tried to put work in on myself, you know. And I'm, I believe that it worked pretty good because I'm not as bad as it used to be. So I was, I was challenged to go to UTC. So my next step is to, to go, to follow through with that. And I leave tomorrow, tomorrow morning. Amsterdam. So I just want to say thank you to everybody and uh, I love you guys. Aha. Uh -huh. How many of you have been praying for him? I know some of you have been praying. Loving on him. We love you, mijo. All those verses that God was showing you in the home, all those things you highlighted in your Bible. The Bible says that his word does not return void. And we're believing there's going to be a great return. Amen? And um, for my children, for your children, for our children. Come on, somebody. For the children of the San Gabriel Valley and, 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 and beyond, you know, we're believing that. If you're claiming that for your family, I just want you to reach out and grab that. Yes. Say, Lord, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to receive that. I want to believe that for my children. And I know great and mighty things are going to happen, Papa. You know, let's lay our hands on him. Amen. Pastor Danny, would you pray for us? Amen. Stretch your hands. Father, right now we come before you. Father, we pray for Nehemiah right now, God. His life has been in your hands. Father, your word says that you know the end from the beginning. And your plans will prevail. And Father, we see the fulfillment of your plan prevailing over Nehemiah's life, God. And so, Father, I pray that you continue to move through him. Father, continue to build him. Father, I pray that you would guide him, protect him, be with him, God. Father, as he begins to separate on this journey, God. Father, there at the UTC, I pray that you reveal yourself in a whole new way. 
Lord, that you reveal your plan in this time of separation, that he would fall in love with you, knowing that he's been called from birth, oh God. Father, I pray, God, that he would be the world shaker, God, that he would be the one, God, to go and break ground wherever he goes, Lord. Father, he is an influencer, God. He is a leader that you want to use. And Lord, right now, we cover him in prayer. Father, I pray that you would be with him, God. Be with him in the name of Jesus, Lord. Father, I ask that you continue to guide him through this journey. Let him not come back the same, God. Let him not come back the same, but Lord, fill him with your power, your anointing. Father, fill him once again today in the name of Jesus. Amen. And Come on, let's give Jesus some praise. That's the type of praise in a non-growing church, but we're in a growing church. Can you praise him just a little bit more? Hey! Yes! It's good to be here with my good friend, Pastor Ezra. You know, me and Pastor Ezra, we dream together. We were backstage one, one, one conference, man. We were just like, hey, if you go out, I'll go with you. Oh, remember that? We were backstage just dreaming. We were like, if you go out, I'll go with you. Well, if you go out, I'll go with you. We were just like, let's just go do something. <laughs> and little did we know that God was preparing us for our own cities. <laughs> Me there in Arizona Mesa. And you here in West Covina, and Pastor Ezra, I love you and your family so very much. And uh, it's good to be with the other growing church in Victory Outreach. There's two growing churches <laughs> that are killing it right now. Let it be known all over the internet. I ain't afraid to say it. I ain't afraid to shout it. I ain't afraid to give God the glory. It's only because of God. So the only two, no, not, not the only two, but the two fastest growing churches. We're, you know, humbly saying. It's good to be with the other one. Okay, you guys good? Yeah. I said you guys good? Yeah. All right, I won't be too long, I promise. Because we're going we gonna to stir it up in here. You, you, the home is hype. I literally feel like I'm with family. Luke, you killed it, bro. Good job, dude. All right, you guys ready? I said, are you ready? Let me make a quick correction, Pastor Ezra. You don't have three services. You have four services. Sunday is four services. You have nine, 11, one, and six. Four services. Talk about groundbreaking. Y'all don't even know what y'all doing. You're just like, let's just do another one. By the end of the night, you're going to be like, let's have an 8 p.m. Like, what? Brother got five services. <laughs> Pastor Ezra, I am blessed, blessed to see your church growing. I'm so blessed. I'm going back home. I'm doing another service, too. <laughs> That's it. Mesa, if you're logged on, we're going to the one. John chapter 12, verse 9. Just let's read this real quick. John chapter 12, verse 9. And uh, we'll read it quick. We're going to get right into it. And then we're going to get into the altar call. Is that cool? Can we do that? John chapter 12, verse 9. I'm going to read out of the NLT. John 12, verse 9. The Bible says, when all the people heard Jesus' arrival, they flocked to see him. How many know when Jesus shows up, everybody wants to see him? 
Jesus was like a superstar at this time, doing miracles, doing all these things. And the Bible says when, when they heard that he was coming, they all flocked to see him. Many of us came tonight to see this Jesus. Many of us showed up tonight because we know what it feels like to be in the presence of the Lord. So the Bible says they flocked to see him. But watch this. And also to see Lazarus. Also to see Lazarus, the man that Jesus had raised from the dead. Then the leading priest decided to kill Lazarus too. They were like, not only are we going to kill Jesus, but we're going to kill Lazarus too. Why? For it was because of him. Watch this. For it was because of him that many people had deserted them and believed in Jesus. That's going to preach right there. Y'all ain't feeling me, but that's going to preach right there. Turn to your neighbor and says, many are going to be deserted because of me. We'll go ahead and take your seat here today. And I'm going to preach for the next 15 minutes. Is that cool? Here the Bible says that very clearly that when Jesus would show up to different places, that there was large crowds that would come and want to come and see Jesus perform these miracles. But what's so powerful about this scripture is that we know that people show up when Jesus is in the building. But what's powerful about this is that the Bible says that people flocked to go and see this man named Lazarus. Now, Lazarus was a man that he had a role to play, that the Lord was going to use Lazarus to draw people unto him. See, Lazarus was the one that didn't need a stage. Lazarus didn't need a microphone. Lazarus didn't need any type of announcement. But what Lazarus did was Lazarus, Lazarus' life was so much louder than any PA system than anything in the newspaper, his life was so much louder because of what God was ready to do through him. And here in Lazarus' life, you got to know that he had a role to play. And his role to play was to, to allow his testimony to be used by God so that people could come and recognize who this man was at one time. When I look in the building, I see a building full of people that got a role to play. When I look through the aisles, I see people with tattoos, with scars. Y'all ain't hearing me. I see people that got a role to play. We're not just here playing church. We're not here looking cute. We're here because God has called us to play a role. The Bible says in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, but you shall receive what? You shall receive power and you will be my witness in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. See, my friend, I want you to know that the power that God wants to release in your life, it's not just a power for you to, to, to hold on for yourself, but it is a power of, that God wants to release into your life so that you can live a life of service. A life of service. The Bible says the Holy Spirit will come upon you. In other words, he's going to give you an empowerment. But that empowerment, it's not for us to be selfish. It's not for us to just hold on and say, man, I got the power now. No, that power is to be released, the Bible says, so that you can be my witness. Somebody say, I got a role to play. So that you could be my witness. And here in this city and even surrounding cities, I hear people talking about this church, that God is raising this church up. You are being a witness, but we need to continue to do so. We need to fill up our 1 p.m. service. We need to fill up our 6 p.m. service, and then we're going to see what else God wants to do. Somebody say, I got a role to play. We all have a role to play. That role is to draw people. 
See, with Lazarus, you got to understand that God wasn't done with him yet. Even though he died, but God was not done with him yet. He still had something more to do. And it was because of this man that many people left their old belief system. Many people left what, they, what they've always thought was, was the way to do things. They left their traditions. They left all that stuff aside. And they came to serve Jesus. They deserted all those things. Like many of us today, we have deserted our old neighborhood. Come on. We deserted that old pipe. Some of you left the pipe on the table and said, I ain't never coming back to that. I found Jesus. We have also deserted things because of Jesus. But this man had a role to play. This man's life testified about the goodness of God. It testified about God's goodness. I could hear Lazarus now at a, at a Victory Outreach West Covina street rally. Putting out the speakers and saying, yo, it's time to go. Hey, rally up to home. Let's go. I can see him setting up on the block. West Covina style. Banners. Loudness. At this time, we'd like to call up a man named Lazarus. He has something to say. I could just hear him now. Stepping up to the microphone in our times and say, wait, I got something to say. I got something to say. I was once dead. But now I'm alive. I could hear this man testify like some of you testify. I was once blind, but now I see. I could hear this man testify. Man, I was down and out. I was as dead as dead can be. I was dead, as a matter of fact, for four days. Nobody wanted to be around me because I stank. Imagine, the Bible says he was stanky. He said, nobody want to be around me. Nobody want to come to my tomb. None of that stuff. How many been there before? Oh, y'all holy in this church. In Mesa, we stank over there, man. We don't just come in all suited and booted, man. We come in a mess. Hey, but Lazarus was one that I could just hear him testify about these things. I was bound. I was lost. I was hurting. But look at Jesus has set me free. The Bible even talks about when Jesus was coming in on Palm Sunday. The Bible says that Jesus was coming into Palm Sunday. He was going through, the, through, uh, through Jerusalem. And the Bible says that news spread and started going everywhere. And a large crowd came to come and see him. This is where we see the palm branches and all those things that we just witnessed uh, Easter here a, a couple weeks ago. Or actually, a couple weeks ago, we witnessed uh, Palm Sunday. But look at what happens here. The Bible begins to really describe what takes place. The Bible says that many came to come see this Jesus, but many in the crowd came to see Jesus because they heard that that man, Lazarus, the one that came out of the tomb, was about to be there. So they came looking for him. They came to see it with their own eyes. They couldn't believe it. They couldn't believe, man, is he going to be there? I got to get there because he's going to be there. He's going to be there. And I'm going to tell you something. In this room, there is people just like Lazarus. You got a role to play. And people are going to come see the man, the myth, the legend. Yes, you. They're going to say, is he going to be there? Because if God can do it for them, then God surely could do the impossible. God can surely do the impossible. The Bible says in John chapter 12, verse 12, it says that that was the reason so many had came out to meet him. Because they heard of this miraculous sign. The Pharisees said to each other, there's nothing we can do. Let's look after this now. Even they started tripping. They were like, man, there's nothing that we can do about it. News is going out. People are catching wind. 
People are just flocking to that place. Why? There's nothing that we can do. Even the haters are trying to stop it, but they can't. I don't know if you got haters in the building. I don't know if you got haters outside the building. I don't know if your neighbors are haters. They're probably like, oh, look at all those cars again. It's Wednesday night. Now they want to add another service. Now they're going to have four services. What's wrong with that church? Won't they just move already? Haters. But I'm going to tell you something. When news gets out, there's nothing that nobody can do. And news is getting out. There's nothing that anybody could do. God is going to be God and God's going to pack this. They said there's nothing that we can do. I'm here to tell you. The enemy is saying just that about this church here tonight. There is nothing that we can do. We can't stop what God is doing. We can't stop the people from coming. We can't stop it. We can't stop it. They don't care if the building's too small. They don't care. They don't care because there's nothing that we can do to stop that. And I think tonight you got to know that there's nothing the enemy can do to stop that. There's nothing that he can do to stop that. So the story goes on, and I want to look at what happened. Why were they so amazed about this miracle? Well, this miracle is a pretty amazing miracle. This is a miracle where Jesus finds his friend Lazarus dead. And when he finds his friend dead, he begins to say, man, I got to get over there. Mary was all mad. Everybody's all irritated, right? And his disciples really didn't understand what was going on. They just knew he's got to get there. Well, when he shows up, what happens is that he shows up and they start debating, man, he's been dead already. There's nothing you can do. You're too late. But sometimes we do feel like God's late. How many feel like sometimes God's late? Like, God, I thought you were going to show up. But sometimes we feel like this. Sometimes we feel like it's late. Sometimes we feel like he doesn't show up. But I'm here to tell you something. There's something powerful that God can do when a miracle links up to who he is. When a miracle links up to who he is, something supernatural takes place in an individual life. The Bible says that Jesus showed up and he was pretty irritated, pretty angry, the Bible says. When he shows up, he's angry and he arrived at the tomb. And at that cave, there was a stone there rolled across that entrance. And that stone was there. And that stone had kept Lazarus in the place where he was dead. In other words, there was nothing that they can do about it. He was dead already. I think many times in life we feel like that. We feel like maybe our dreams have died. Maybe we feel like, man, I don't know how this is going to work out. Maybe you feel like you're in a tomb sometime. Sometimes you feel like, man, there's barriers in my way. But I love what happened is that Bible says that Jesus was angry when he arrived at the tomb. At the cave, the stone was rolled across the entrance. He says to them, roll that stone aside, he told them. Roll that stone aside. But Martha, the dead man's sister, protested. Lord, he has been dead for four days. I'm here to tell you, when God has a purpose for your life, there is nothing that's going to stand in God's way. When God has a purpose for your life, there is nothing that can stand in its way. When I see us praying for Nehemiah, I'm here to tell you, God has purpose for that young man's life. And there is nothing that can stand in its way. There is people in the room today. You need to know that there is more purpose that God has for your life. And there is nothing that's going to stand in God's way. There is no stone. There is no trial. There is nothing that's going to stop the move of God for your life. Some of you need to know today, there is more purpose for your life today. You still have a role to play. 
I don't care what they rolled in front of you. I don't care what they try to lock you up in. I don't care what the enemy is trying to place you in even tonight. Maybe insecurity, maybe doubt, maybe fear. I'm here to tell you, it's time to roll the stone aside. Whatever's been stopping you from your next level, it's time to roll the stone aside. It's time to get it out the way. It's time to say, I don't see any more limitations. Roll that stone aside. I got more that God wants to do through my life. You might be in a smelly place. You might feel like you're locked up. You might feel stuck. I'm here to tell you, there is more for your life, and God's about to roll that stone aside. He says, roll that stone aside. Martha was a hater. I don't know what Martha's problem was. Martha was protesting, man, Jesus, don't go in there. This boy stank. He's been in there for four days. For four days he's been in there. I don't think you want to go in there. He wasn't tripping about what he smelled like. He wasn't tripping about his current situation. He just said, I'm about to take him out of that season. I'm about to roll that stone aside. I'm about to take them to another level. Roll it to the side. Roll it to the side. I know some of us might feel like, man, I don't know if I'm going to get out of this. I don't know if I'm going to ever get out of this situation. Man, it smells rotten. My, my money smells rotten. Everything's rotten. I, you just walk around like everything's rotten. Jesus said, I'm about to roll that stone aside. Watch what the rest of this verse says. It's so powerful. Then Jesus looked up to the heaven and said, Father, thank you for hearing me. You always hear me. How many know that Jesus, when he would get away, he would go speak to his father and his father would always hear him. Those moments where he would pray, he would cry out in those secret places. He says, you always hear me. But watch this. He says, but I say it out loud. For the sake of everybody standing here, that they could hear my prayer today. This wasn't a prayer that Jesus was just going to say under his breath. This wasn't a prayer that he was just going to hold and say, Lord, just move, Father, move. No, the Bible declares, I'm going to say this so loud. In other words, I'm going to make this public I want everybody to know I'm about to make the biggest announcement anybody has ever heard. Listen to me now. For some of you here tonight, I believe that God is about to release the biggest announcement that you have ever heard about your life. You know, people like making announcements. Oh, we boot up now. It ain't real till we post it. Shut up. Oh, we engage now. You mean, yeah, I mean, their announcements are ridiculous now. I just told my, I told my wife, man, when I wanted to date her, hey, you want to be with me? Yeah, all right, let's go. Let's go. I said, man, get in the car. Let's roll. It wasn't nothing special. I proposed to my wife at Denny's, man. I said, you want to marry me? She was like, yeah, let's roll then. If she said yes at Denny's, it's only up from there. Some of you want helicopters. I'm coming down. Will you marry me? Drama. Some of you are so much drama with your announcements. And then when you want to go have a baby, oh, my God, your announcements are even worse. Man, we had babies, man. Hey, I got popped another one. Here you look. Nowadays, you want colors. <laughs> Throwing baseballs. Boom, color. Who cares? 
You're like, I got to announce it. Who cares? Some of us know how to be extreme with announcements. But I'm here to tell you, Jesus made a declaration. He made the announcement of all announcements. He said, this man's been dead for four days, and I want everybody. I need everybody in the neighborhood, everybody in the street corner, everybody in the seat in the city to hear this announcement. I'm about to make it public. So Jesus shouted, Lazarus! He shouted, Lazarus! Come out of that grave! I'm here to tell some people tonight that God is about to call your name and make it public. Everybody is about to hear your name called tonight. They're going to hear your name called. People are going to say, what is going on? I'm here to tell you, God is about to make the biggest announcement that some of you are coming out of debt. Some of you are stepping into prosperity like you ain't never seen. Some of you are about to step into your calling, step into your... He's making an announcement. He's declaring that this city is about to hear what is happening in your life. He said, Lazarus! Lazarus! Come out of that grave! I don't know what you've been in lately. I don't know what you've been stuck in lately, but God's about to roll that stone aside and say, that ain't going to hold you back. I better get some keyboards. That, that's not going to hold you back no more. I'm here to release some people from their graves. I'm here to release some people from bondage. I'm here to release some people to say he's about to call your name. He's about to call your name. He said, come out. Some of you coming out tonight. Some of you are coming out tonight. See, Jesus, don't, it don't matter to Jesus what it looks like on the inside, on the outside. He will step into all our garbage. He said, I don't care. Martha was protesting. He said, I don't care. Put, roll that thing aside. I'm stepping into all his mess. Some of you don't want to let Jesus in your mess. But once he gets in the mess, I said, once he gets in the mess, he can say, I know where you are. I know where you've been. I know what you're going through. But it's time to come. Somebody say, I'm coming out. Watch this. The dead man came out. What? The dead man came out. Take a seat for a second. I'm almost done. Just three more minutes, Pastor Ez. Is that cool? Hey, this dead man came out. He called his name. How crazy is that? The dead man came out. He said, Lazarus, come out. Dude, imagine this dude was gone, dead. <laughs> Peace out. He hears his name. Some of you are going to hear your name like you never heard it before tonight. You know, my son Jedi, he's seven years old. He's sitting right there. That boy calls my name all day. Papi, 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 papi. That's what he calls me. Papi, papi, papi. I hear it all the time, all the time, all the time, all the time. But that there's other kid. He says my name and I go like, what? <laughs> there's something happens when somebody calls your name and it catches your attention. You hear your name all the time. But tonight God's about to call your name and you're going to hear it like you've never heard it before. <laughs> Lazarus, come out. He heard his name like he ain't never heard before. He said, I'm by Magic, I'm getting out. I had to put myself in the tomb in order to preach this, though. I was like, yo, what does that look like? Dude was dead, shouted his name. Everybody's standing there. 
And the Bible says that, that this dead man came out. His hands and feet were bound in grave clothes. His 